It is, we're in this every day, whether it is building the church, whether it is going to work, whether it's building your marriage, whether it is working on a project, whether it is raising your children, every single decision, it's this, that thing between you've started, are you going to finish? And there's a very, very, very real enemy out there that we want to get you in the middle because who knows, we spoke about the, di- the dinosaurs, we spoke about Moses and the desert and the... <laughs> No, guys, Joseph was up the whole night. But anyway, we spoke about the desert and how the enemy would want to take you out in the desert. And you can see it. It's an arid place, but it's full of life. And the thing is that the Israelites step into the desert and then there's nothingness. What we would see as nothingness. We would see it as restraint. We would see it as confinement. We would see it as discipline. And often we see those things and say, God, you're just disciplining me. I'm in a place of dryness. I'm in a place of desert. But how many of us know that when you're in those dry places, that's where the enemy would want to take us out? A few years, weeks or months ago, we, we read a little portion out of the screw tape letters. And it's this whole conversation where it's like the devil and his little helpers speaking about this person. He says, if these human beings could just turn away, if they would just stop, we win. He says, but even if they crawl, even if they just push themselves forward, even if they, in their hearts, can't move, but they, they, they're thinking about God and they're calling out to God, they're still winning because he is never going to leave them or forsake them. And it's this whole conversation, if you've not read the screw tape letters, go and read it. Because we are in a very, very real fight. We are in a very, very very real journey with what God wants for us as a church. We sit specifically today, we sit around you going, where is everybody? I don't know, but the plan of God has not changed for us. Last week, we give a massive announcement that we have the opportunity to take over a school. And then this week we're going, okay, but what are you doing with the church? In the beginning of the year, we speak about 150, God, we want 150. And then we look at each other and going, where are all our friends today? God's plan has not changed for us. What I spoke about last week, what the word he gave to us last year and how he's been building us, preparing us, doesn't change when we come to church and there's only three of us. It doesn't change. Yet somehow in that middle, we sort of go, well, maybe I had it wrong. Maybe it's not the way I thought it was going to be. But the thing is, how many of us know that sometimes God says he will never leave us nor forsake us, but we can lose sight of Jesus. Do you know that there's a story in the Bible where Mary and Joseph are going somewhere and then they lose Jesus, not just for five minutes because he's hiding underneath the rail in, the, in, in a, a shop or he's run out the door or, you know, they, they have to quickly go back because they thought the other one had him or, you know, you, you perceive things or you have a misunderstanding between things. But they literally were on their journey and they went and did these sacrifices and the next minute they're on their way back. And for three days, they had no idea where Jesus was. And so as I was thinking about that story, it's like they were on a mission. They were going, they did what they thought they had to do, they had to do, and they turned around and they went back. Because how many of us live a life that is deadlines, 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 have got to do list, to do list, to do list. So we come to church, we quickly do what we need to do and we go out, or we have our quiet time, we sit down, we have five minutes, and we get up and we go away. But this story, when I thought about it, is that sometimes we thinking we, we're doing what we need to do, but all we're doing is going, okay, Jesus, I'm on in a hurry. Can you come with me? Jesus, I've got this next meeting I need to go to. Can you come with me? And that's fine. Don't hear what I'm not saying is that he goes wherever we go. But sometimes, just because you've achieved something in a certain place, he stayed a bit longer. He stayed behind. And how often are we so ready to rush past that going, oh, done, let's turn around and go, when he's going, just wait. Just wait, we have to stay here a little bit longer. And so we lose sight of him. We run ahead and he's going, just wait. Just wait here. Just stay a little bit longer. And I heard about a story the other day um, where somebody, they had meetings after meetings after meetings and they were about to go and they were it's church builders and um, they were planting another church in another place and, and it was like an hour to go and this guy had to, uh, he's like, we've got an hour, I'm just going to quickly walk the dog. And so the wife says, okay, no problem, you go, but don't be late. Please don't be late. We've got meetings back to back today. Don't be late. And so he runs off and goes and walks their dog, big dog and what have you. And um, 20 minutes goes past and now it's time to leave. And an hour goes past and he's not back yet. And obviously he didn't take his cell phone because it was just around the block. And um, now the wife is, she, she's getting cross because she's like, I told him not to be late. So now she's phoned the office going, we're not going to make this meeting. 
We're late. I have no idea who my husband is. And it's amazing how different people's responses are different. She got cross. I would have got scared. But um, it's like, where is he? Why is he not back again or whatever? So she starts getting cross. Two hours, th- three hours passed. And she didn't know where he was. And she didn't know where he had gone. But they had missed their entire church plant meeting. They were starting a brand new church. It wasn't a small t- meeting. It wasn't just another, you know, um, logistic meeting it was a big deal like the whole board had come and so she tells the story of how he walks in and he says you need to sit down she says now he never speaks to her like that so when he said that she thought I better sit down so he sits down and he says she goes where were you he goes he was walking the dog and they've got like a lab and the next minute they would they live somewhere out in the country and uh he walked down and the next minute the dog just ran and when he looked down there was an old man with a tiny little pup like just an old little, you know, little dog. And he thought, oh, let me just run because this dog is quite big and I don't want him to, you know, frighten this this old man and this other dog. So let me just go down and, and see if he's okay and, you know, or not okay, just sort of prevent any situation from arising. So he goes down and he goes, sorry, sorry, this is my dog. It's okay. And the old man goes, no, it's okay. And um, he's about to take the dog away and God goes, so quick. Are you leaving so quick? And uh, he, he felt, he stopped and he looked at the guy. He goes, hi, my name is... My name is Steve. And the guy goes, how my name is, whatever it is. And, um, and he goes, um, are you okay? Let's call him Bill for the reason, for the story. And Bill goes, no, I'm actually not. And he stayed because he was about to rush back because he had a meeting to attend. A big deal in a church that's planting another church. And, you know, and the guy looked at him, this, this guy, his name is Steve, he goes, are you okay? And he goes, actually, I'm not. And Steve stopped and he said he could have totally walked away from that man. And all that man wanted was just to say, he goes, well, my name is, is, is Stephen. What can I do for you? He goes, you know what? I'm an old man. My, husband, my, my, my son, he's in his 30s. He's back home. He's an addict and he's an alcoholic. And he's threatened me. He said, I either need to go and buy him alcohol right now or he's going to leave and go and find um, a supplier. Is what's the word you use, you know, to go and get a fix. And he says, now I'm standing here and I'm not too sure what I'm going to do. He, he's got an ultimatum. Either he can get in the car, go and drink and s- kill somebody along the way or go and get a fix and totally overdose and die. But either way, like this man doesn't know what to do. This man, this old man who's got his son at home that's threatening him in his 30s and he doesn't know what to do. So Steve said to him, so Bill, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to go home. So Steve says to him, Bill, I'm coming with you. He goes, no, you can't come with me. You got, nobody comes to our house. So Steve goes, you know what? I'd love a cup of tea. And I would love to come with you to your house. So he goes, an hour passes. They walk back. They walk into the house. And um, he sits down and he speaks to Bill. And he goes upstairs and he meets the son. And he speaks to the son. And he said to Bill, he goes, nobody thinks about us. We've forgotten. He goes, I'm going to meet you every Thursday. I'm coming to your house. Every Thursday, I'm coming to your house and um, we will meet and we will pray. So he prays for Bill and he prays for his son. Goes home, cancels all his appointments for every Thursday until whenever. Goes, change all my appointments for Thursdays. I'm no longer seeing anybody. Every Thursday, he goes to his wife. He goes, we need to increase our food, Bill. We have adopted Bill, this old man. He's part of our family now. We have to take care of him. He did not come to church. He did not ask him to church. He said, I'm coming to you. I'm going to actually show you that I don't need anything from you, but I actually believe that this is what, you know, God wants for us. And and so I'm going to come alongside you and you are part of our family now. So every Thursday, Steve would come and he'd have groceries for him and they would pray and they'd go for a walk. Three years passed and then Bill started coming to church and then Bill started coming and he gave his life to God. But because of that moment where he goes, sorry about my dog, sorry, got to be off, I've got to get to the next meeting, God goes, just wait, just wait. And how easy is it in the middle between the beginning and the end of what you're doing that there's something waiting for you, a miracle waiting for you, and you could be the miracle for somebody else. And so now Bill is saved, and they're working this journey out, and he's still, every single Thursday, meeting with Bill. 
Isn't that beautiful? Now that's not an unattainable, unachievable, it's only meant for some. But if we're on our journeys going, okay, God, I have to do this. And we're going, can you follow me? Can you keep up with me? And he's going, well, hang on, I've stayed back and you carried on moving. We miss out on what he might have for us in the middle. So the beginning has promises of awesomeness, excitement, of, you know, you can just see your dream like unfold before your eyes. Here, maybe some of us have started jobs or applied for jobs or signed up to university degrees. I'm talking to us because I know us. You know, we had children or we've got all these things in our hearts and we sort of go, what's going to happen next? And we started the journey and now we're at the place going, I actually feel a bit overwhelmed. I actually don't know if this is going to plan. I actually don't know if I'm going to make it to the other side and in the end you know that if you could just achieve it this the amount of celebration there's going to be when a baby's born everybody celebrates when you've got through that like how was it how's your I mean we've we've had so many babies born in this church that celebration and that expectation and that whole thing is it's amazing when you've got that team of people around you going you can do it the joy at the end is amazing it's amazing but in the middle That's where, when you signed on that dotted line, the commitment kicks in. That's when you say, I do, you actually have to. That's when you have your baby and you look at it and you're going, I need to sleep. Then you actually go, okay, well, I actually have to push past this. The commitment kicks in for what you signed up in your excitement, in your expectation. But let's look at Mark 6, verse 4. Or from verse 4. And um, it's a story we all know and a story we've preached about and a story we'll probably come back to so many times. And it says that it's basically just following up. Jesus just feeds the 5,000 with those few loaves and few fishes. And he's about to fish. fish, And he's about to, you know, carry on. And he says to the disciples, okay, now you've seen this miracle, immediately get in the boat, go to the other side. So they're still like, what a good day to be a disciple. We're actually being part of these miracles. It's going great. Finally, you know, the payoff for what we signed up to be God's helpers and disciples. First-hand experience. This is amazing. And then he goes, okay, that's enough. Let's go. And he puts them in a boat and he says, go to the other side. He says, and then he goes off to pray and he says, I'll meet you there. Now, the thing about this story, let me read it to you. It says, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down on the ground and the um, groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks. He broke the loaves and gave them to eat. Then the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Immediately, Jesus says to his disciples, get into the boat, go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. And while... He dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountain to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought it was a ghost and they cried out because all they saw, uh, because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. So what he said to the disciples, we've got to know this. He said, get in a boat, use your oars and get yourself to the other side. Now, the thing about that is not just another part of the story and Jesus is going to walk on water. What he told them to do was what they were used to doing. They were fishermen. Every single day, they would get on a boat, which was their area of work. They would use the oars because that's what they knew that was the tools in their hands. And they were doing exactly what they did every single day. Nothing spectacular about it. Nothing more higher above them or below them or, you know, nothing that they have to even think about. He goes, get in a boat. The thing you do every single day, pick up those oars and row. The things that I've already t- taught you to do, the things you would do without thinking, you get up, you go to work, you get up, you raise your children, you get up, you get on a train, you get up, you, you study, you get up, you, you know, you go through your days. It was an ordinary thing for them to do. And how often... When God says to us, okay, there you go, get up, do what you need to do, and then we don't we we miss out. We we miss the 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 gem or the 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 diamonds in the ordinary of what he's asking us to do. 
Because there's things that we're going to do that are going to look like ordinary, everyday responsibilities. There's things that every time the enemy knows if he gets us into the middle and we lose sight, we lose sight of the excitement of why we started and we totally don't see the joy of completion, he says, I'm going to get you there. Because he walks around looking who he can steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he does. And in the dry land, when you have, when you're like thirsting and when you're going, I don't know which way, he knows, I can take you out there because you're going to think there's nothing else left for you. He goes, and so that's where I'm going to get you. Because we haven't quite reached there, and that's when the follow me, and that's when, why did I sign up to that? Then that's when, why did I start this process, kicks in where you go, how am I doing with this? How am I doing with this, Jesus? Have I decided and am I still? I have decided and am I still? Because if we could push past that point of the middle, if we could push past that point of, I don't know if I'm going to make it, but when you go past halfway mark, you're actually further away from the starting point and closer to the finish. And the enemy knows if he can keep you behind that middle point or just on that middle point, he can keep you there for ages. And so what is it that God has put before you? What is the ordinary boat he's told you to get in? What are the oars that you have in your hands to get you across this, this, this little lake to get you to the other side? Perhaps it is going, make that phone call. You don't know what's on the other side. He goes, perhaps it is, you know what to do. So often we go, have you done this? Oh, no, I know I need to do this. Hey, have you got on your knees and prayed and trust God? Because you know what to do. It's an everyday, ordinary tool that he's already given to you. He said, you can do this to get you to the other side. Maybe open your Bible. You know what to do. It's his word. Open your Bible. Find out what he has for you. It restores. It washes. It totally rejuvenates us when we read his word because it's alive. And he's, it's God breathed. And God is life. And so when we read these scriptures and when we wait a little bit, you wake up and you sort of go, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Nothing's changed. But God, your word stays true. Maybe it is put on that worship. Take your, your eyes off your circumstances. Put them on Jesus because you know what to do. It's an everyday ordinary task that if you've been doing this long enough it will feel like nothing like I've I've done it before I've done it before I've done it before and he's going do it again you've just seen a miracle now do it again go back to ordinary maybe it is about staying grateful maybe it is about going you know what I've got a job you know what I've got a church you know what I've got children you know what I've got an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody by just saying how are you today I don't think Steve thought he was going to get the answer he did when he said to the guy, are you okay? He could have said, oh, I've lost my wife, or I'm just a bit tired, or had a late night. Do you you know, it could have been anything. But to get that opportunity to invite somebody to understand the love of God that's selfless, giving in and walking alongside them, who wouldn't want to be part of that? Now, it cost him. It cost him his diary had to change. It cost him some of his finances, and it had to cost him some of his time. But he got to be an opportunity to somebody. The things that God says, maybe, you know, what do you need to do? Well, you need to think right. Perhaps we're not thinking right. Perhaps we're starting to doubt. Perhaps we're starting to go down things where God goes, don't think those things. He says, think of things that are true, that are noble, that are right, that are pure, lovely, and admirable, that are excellent and praiseworthy. Get your mind focused on things that are above and not below. And we're going, I don't know. I just don't know if I can do this. And so we grovel. And all you can see is what are those big drills that just go deeper and deeper and deeper into a sort of nothingness. And God's going, no, lift up your eyes because you know what to do. And sometimes all we have to do is actually pick up those oars, get in that boat and row. But it's too ordinary for us sometimes to just do that. And so we think we've missed out because we've just seen a miracle. Why doesn't God just let it fall from the sky like he did with those five fish and two loaves? Why doesn't he just, or the other way around, two fish and five loaves? Because the thing is God is still in charge. He hasn't changed. So when he says get in your boat and row, it's the same God that just did the miracle on the shore. But watch this. He says, I'll meet you on the other side. You've got my word. I promise you this. Just go. Go. Get on your boat. Do your ordinary thing. Pick up your oars and row. And then he says, in the middle. In the middle. He looked up and he thought, they're taking strain. Something's happened in the middle. They're not quite where he wants them to be. But they're not where he left them. He goes, in the middle. He looks at them and he goes, 
they're taking strain. Something's happening. Something's getting a bit hard. Something is not like as easy as it should be. So then he gets up and he walks past them. Now, how many times have we read the story and thought, why does he walk past them? He's like as if he was going to walk straight past them. Have you thought about that? And we thought about, that's a bit like cheeky. Like, why didn't God just stop and going, I'm here, I'm here, I've got to help you. You know, it's all okay. I mean, but when you think about the things, the first time they're in the boat and there's a storm, he's sleeping. Now they're in a storm and it's getting hard. He's going to walk past them. It's like, he's a bit of a joker, right? But the thing is, have you maybe thought about the fact that God goes, I've just shown you a miracle. You've just started off something. You're in the middle between what's going to happen on the other side. I'm just going to remind you that it's me. He says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Do not fear of the. Do not fear the future. That's what he's basically he's saying. He's like, do not fear. It is I. Take courage. And immediately he's walking past them, and in the middle, they had to be reminded of who's the one that started them in the first place. Just he pitches up. He doesn't take charge, right away. He just pitches up, and immediately they turn and look to him, in that middle space. So wherever we find ourselves today. We started the journey, we got a school sitting, sitting on a boundary line, nothing's happening. And you're going, well, what's happening there? You started a job and now you're working away or you're feeling yourself, oh, I'm going, I can't keep up like this. People aren't here today because they're tired. People are doing everything they need to do. Families aren't seeing each other. You're going, why am I doing this? And it's almost as if he's going to go, don't forget, here I am. Like he's just going to walk past. And sometimes we want him to get in the boat, take hold of the oars and just do it. And he will, but he also says, I've given you my word. I've given you my word. You know what to do. You know that to just push past, stand on my word, take those oars, just get in your boat and keep going. He goes, you know what to do. Don't forget, I'm going to meet you on the other side because he's already there. He's already with you. He's already there. He's already doing it. But in the middle, in the middle, when things aren't looking the way they are, he pitches up. He's never going to leave you either. Although he's just walking past going, don't forget. Let me remind you. He pitches up in the middle where they saw him. The attention went to Jesus and they were confirmed. And they, I mean, then they continued. They continued to go, you know what? I can do this. It's an ordinary boat and it's everyday oars. But I can do this because that is what's going to get you to the other side. Every single one of us. It's not all the things we can do. God says, don't think more highly of you than you ought or, or more lowly than you ought because it's all about him anyway. So it's not about our qualifications, although he says, I'm going to use those qualifications. He will. It's not about our, our abilities and strength. It's not about how good or bad we are. He goes, because it's all about him anyway. And so when we commit all those things to him, he goes, pick up the phone. He says, pick up those oars, make that connection, speak to your boss, speak to this, speak to the person next to you, carry on with your children. You're doing a good job. You will get to the other side. See, the thing is about the middle, they could have just been like transfigured onto the other side because that's happened before. Jesus just was like, oh, I'll meet you on the other side and he's there. He could have, or he could have said, just wait with me. I'm going to show you another little miracle. Close your eyes. Oh, we're in Bethsaida. He could have totally done that. But the thing is, Unless you're in the miracle, in the middle of the, of the sea, you're not going to see a Jesus that walks on water. They got to see a Jesus that walked on water towards them. And that's what's going to happen is in the middle. He will do miracles right before our eyes, right before them, in between, before we see, you know, why we've had to work so hard, why we've had to be on our knees, why we've had to pray and take authority, why we have to say, God, your word says... He says, in that place, when we're pushing into him, when we're at the desperate things where we're going, I don't know what else to do. He goes, right now, in front of your very eyes, I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to do it. We saw it in the desert. Right now, there is no food for you, but I'm going to give you food. Right now, these waves look like they're going to be crashing over you, but I'm going to get you through this. He will do a miracle right before your eyes. And those things that seem like they're overwhelming you, and those things that feel like they're pushing you over and that are stopping you from getting to the other side will become glassy still. If we would just open our eyes and say, okay, what is about to happen in this miracle? And so, Dazza, sorry, can we put those scripture up? And so in my preparation, I've, I've started this journey. You guys all know it. And I'm, 
I'm still, I'm still being accountable. I'm still on my, my everyday sort of pushing and saying, God, what do you want for me personally? What do you want for us as a church? What do you want for us individually? And one of the things I, I, um, scriptures I came across this week, and when I say came across, it's because you actually read these things and you sort of forget them or you don't read them because sometimes different things speak to you at different times. But when I saw this, it's in the message, I was blown away. I was like, thank you, God, for the reminder. And it says, but now God's message, the God who made you in the first place, God made you in the first place. The one who got you started. He got us started. Those things that he said sign up to in the beginning, those things that we stepped out in faith, he got us started. He says, do not be afraid. I have redeemed you. I have called your name. He knows your names. You are mine. Not yet. Just tell me. He has totally taken you and he says, you are mine. I know your name. I got you started. You are mine. Think about that. The creator of the universe. He says those things that you put your hand to do, he goes, I got you started. When I said follow me, he says, I got you started. When you signed up to whatever it is that you're feeling is overwhelming you right now, he goes, I got you started. Do not fear. Take courage. It is I, he says, who got you started. Next one, Dad. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. How many of us feel overwhelmed going, I don't know if I'm going to make it through. This is a bit of a big expectation. I find myself constantly in this place. Constantly. Just when I think I got my head around some things, now I have to figure out pensions. I have to figure out pensions and work it out and, you know, sort all these things out. I'm like, pensions? That's like a very degree, right, of something. So I have to sort that out. Then you get your kid and you're like, I've just got this done. And the next minute they stop sleeping. And you're like, I don't know if I can cope doing this or you're doing a job, or you're doing a university degree, or you're in a mindset, and you're going, I don't actually know how to get out of this. If you feel that you're in over your head, when you're in rough waters, perhaps you're feeling anxious, perhaps you're feeling confused, perhaps you're feeling just that you, you don't really know, you know whether he's still there, or you're doubting, or you're questioning. Perhaps there's uncertainty going, there's rough waters, I don't know if I've got the courage. I don't know if I've got the skill. I don't know if I've got the resources to get through this. He goes, if you're in rough waters, you will not go down. That's his promise. You will not go down. And when you're between a rock and a hard place, confusion, bit of a big decision. Do I do this or do I do that? What's going to happen next? Whatever I decide doesn't feel like it's going to be an, out, an easy outcome. How am I going to go forward? Who are the people I'm looking at? Am I going by opinion or am I going by what God said to me? He says it will not be a dead end. Those promises are beautiful. He is with you. You are not going to go down. And you're not at a dead end. So if any one of you are feeling that, going, I don't actually know where else to go because I've exhausted everything in my own ability. I've exhausted everything in my mind. I've like gone where I can go. I don't know if I'm going to get back to the place where I want to be. I don't know if I'm going to get past this middle point. And he's going, you're not going to go down. This is not the dead end. The promises that he spoke to us, the faith that we put out, he says, I got you started. We didn't just pull out a number and go, okay, God, we're going to trust you for a thousand. He's like, 150. Last year we trusted for 10. And it happened without us really knowing. We prayed into it. He got us started. He got this church started. He got your marriage started. He got your kids started. He got your future started. It's not a dead end for you. But look at this. Because I am God, your personal God. He is our personal God. Individually and uniquely, our personal God. I just, I just sat back last night. I was, there was no internet. So um, I couldn't do a lot of you know, research here, there, and the next. So I just sat staring at my Bible going, God, isn't that beautiful? He is our personal God. And one a long time ago, I was studying. It was last year somewhere. And I actually wrote this down as one of the, like my own sort of quiet times. Like, He's our personal God. An everyday Jesus. He's not just the Jesus of Christmas. That everyone goes, oh, yes, let me not forget. He's this guy that you know, came as a baby, meek and mild. He's not just the Jesus of, of Easter who, who died on the cross and every now and then we go back to the cross. We go back to the cross, which we should go. I'm, I'm talking flippantly, like just whatever, back to the cross. Oh, yes, there's this Jesus. He says, I'm your personal Jesus. In the beginning, because I got you started. In the middle, because you're not going to go down. It's not your dead end. And I'm still with you. 
Because he says, because of the joy set before you, I am your personal God. And so today, I felt quite strongly that I wanted to pray for us as a church. I wanted to pray for us individually and I wanted to pray for us as a group. Because like I said, when you know somebody is with you, you somehow can do it. People that run the Comrades Marathons, they wouldn't do as well as they did if there weren't hordes of people along the way. The people that support, the people that give them the water, the people that go, you can do this. People that go, I'm just going to walk with you. You're tired right now, I'm going to walk with you. Let's walk. The people that go, why don't you sit down, put your feet up for five minutes and go. I mean, I don't know how people get up after that, but they do. And we've got some people that have run it in this. Julia has run the Comrades Marathon, guys. <laughs> I'm like, sure you have, you have. She did. But you know what? It's like, it's, it's the onward thing. And so today as a church, if we're feeling overwhelmed, if we're feeling like we're in over our heads, if we feel like we're in a bit of rough water, if we're feeling that we're in a rock and a hard place and we don't actually know if we're going to get out of this, God goes, I'm your personal God and I'm with you. So I want to pray for us. But before we get there, I'm going to speak about um, Denver. You guys all know the story, but I felt like I wanted to share it again today. As we take up the offering and as I pray for you, I'm going to do two things today. I spoke to a few people before the service just to encourage you. We are not stopping. We are not stopping because God is faithful. He's not a man that he would lie. So if he's spoken something over your life, if he got you started and you're not quite over the middle point yet and you're not quite heading towards your joy of completion, he goes, I got you started in the first place. And so in, in that sort of light of understanding is that you, didn't, you don't just step out and go, okay, God, I'm doing this. Now what? Nothing happens in the middle. So I want to pray. I spoke to Darren before the time. He needs a job. He needs something to break. He needs to know whether it's, this is just, we're talking openly, yeah? He needs to know whether this is a season that he needs to be with the girls and just enjoy it. But it's like, how do you enjoy it when you feel like you should be doing something else? And when you're looking at your bills and when you're looking at all these things. And so as a church, we're going to come alongside them. We're not going to be rah, 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 well done for starting a, a university degree and you're doing so well. And then when they, in the middle, we go, okay. But we're going to go, okay, what are your oars? What are your boat? We got your back. Let's pray for you. We're going to push you through past the middle because we don't want to give up in the middle. Simon, he's been away for quite a while and he's tired and he's in the process of changing jobs to the new thing. God gave him that promotion when half the company, how much was the percentage that was laid off? Round two. So he made it through that. He got a promotion when other people were losing his job. God got you started in the first place. Who else? Joel. You've just been given a new job and you're working away. And it might, you know, I, don't, I haven't really spoken to you, but it might be that you're going, okay, God, I need a bit of head, heads and tails. How does this go? I need creativity. I need to know how to take it to the next place. He got you started in the first place. Darren, you went through a transition as well with your job going, okay, you're moving from one thing to the next thing, but God got you started in the first place. It's not just a dead end. It's not just a, uh, uh, the crumbs off the table. He's not the God that does that. Kelly, whatever God has put in our heart or your heart for what he's put in, you know, kids and speaking over them and educating them and training us. We're all like, Kelly, why is our children doing these things? But anyway, all those things, it's not for nothing. He got you started in the first place. You, hun, you need to trust God. He's going to take you to the next thing because you're not, this is not your, your glass ceiling. This is not where it stops. Julia, your life is just starting. The impact that you're going to have on your family, which you already have, is not just a what next. It's, it's just the beginning of a ripple effect in your mafia family. We call them a mafia family because they're massive. Could you imagine? That's 150 right there under Julia's head. <laughs> Johan, you've got to start embracing them, dude. Um, courts, what God has put in your heart to do, only you know, and you know he's put it in there, whatever it is, whether it's a season or whatever, but he got you started in the first place. You have got way more to give than what you even allow yourself to know. And Tanette, what God has put in you is bigger and the enemy would want to take you out and he, you know the fight you're fighting, but he's not going to keep you there. He's going to take you. You will get through the middle point, that dry place, that place of going, never going back there again. You know the woman at the well? He goes, I thirst. He goes, you'll never have to come back here again. How many of us want to get through this middle? But I want to say, this is just one middle because he says glory to glory. So when you see the joy of what you signed up for, he's going to go, okay, let's start the next chapter. Let's start the next chapter until he comes again. But he says you will never have to go back and thirst and go back to that thing 
every time. And I've got faith. You know, we go, oh, you're on your test, you know, your next test, your next test. But I believe we can have full victory and full authority as we go to the, to the future. So the thing about Denver, he, um, he studied, he went to university, and he, he knew he wanted to come to Bible college. Now, Johnny and Lizzie were not 100% serving God the way they were. They knew they were the Christians and what have you, but they weren't like 100% like, yeah, let's drop it all and go to Bible college. Even my dad, who, who raised me and stuff, he thought I lived in a bubble when I went to Bible college because, you know, you can't just let the reality of life stop. So some of you might have experienced that with your parents. Some of you might have gone, why Bible college? Get a real job. And Denver had just got his university degree or he just started studying when he was in his final year or what have you. And it was also one of the things that we've invested into your life. You can't just go to Bible college, but he got saved when he was 21. And he, he decided he wanted to do it. He wanted to go to Bible college and he put himself into it and he had to find a job and it was tricky because how do you find a job when you're actually studying still but it's got nothing to do with your job and how's that going to look professional when you go and apply for a job and it doesn't make sense. But he wrote down in a journal that he still has. He said, God, I'm trusting you. I am trusting you for a job. I need 2,500 rand as a salary. But I also want a half day job in the line that I'm working in, that's going to allow me to go to Bible college on a, on, in the mornings. Now imagine, I've spoken to Darren about this, he's in the same place. There's certain things he said God has for us. And how, where's your faith? Are you, Joel t- challenged us a few weeks ago, are you right, asking the right questions? There's a difference. God, am I made to go to Bible college? Or, no, how much faith do you have to trust me that you can go to Bible college and you can do a job? And so he goes to this job interview at one of the top quantity surveying companies in Durban. And I think they were still in Berea, but they were moving to Westville, which is literally right around the corner from the church where the Bible college was at the same time. He goes in, has the interview, and they're sitting down and he goes, look, I I can only do part-time. And the guy goes, we can only offer you part-time. He says, but we'd like you to, to consider, you know, part-time to permanent. He goes, okay, but I'm doing Bible college. So the guy goes, okay, well, how much were you hoping to, to earn? And as Denver's about, I can't remember the exact figure. I don't know if it's as he's about to say it or if he said it first, but the guy goes, we can only give you 2,500 rand. The exact number that he had written down in his journal going, God, this is what I need, a part-time job that I can go into full-time with this salary. And he was offered it and he started two weeks later. Where is your faith? Are you between a rock and a hard place going, God, you've made this promise. You got me started. This is the design of my heart. I want to be used by you. Who wants to be used by God? Who wants their middle to be the place where they see doing a miracle, God doing a miracle, going, don't forget, I I got you started in the first place. I said to you, get in this boat, take your oars and cross this lake. He knew what was waiting for them in the middle. He knows what you are facing in your middle. And he's going, okay, let me remind you, I'm here. I got you started. You're not going to go down. So today, even in our finances, as we give, as we, as we do a, a, an extension of God going, you're battling with your finances, then give. He goes, if you're battling with your, with, um, you know, just being able to speak to people, he goes, speak to people. Start. Open your mouth. Conversation. It might not go the way you want to do, but at least you did what you can. He says, you know what you need to do. You know what you need to do. Get in the boat, do the everyday thing, speak to the people you speak to, raise the children you've been given, go to work, speak to your colleagues, make that phone call, drive around the block again, do whatever you need to do, but you know what's in you because he said, I got you started. And he's not just going to leave you there. So I want, um, I want Darren to come stand with me and I want Simon to come stand with me. And if anybody else needs prayer, we need to all stand. I'm saying about those people because I've spoken to them before the service. Does anyone else find themselves in the middle where you're going, I'm between a rock and a hard place, I'm in rough waters, or um, what is the first one? I was on such a good roll, man. Or you're in over your head. And if you're feeling like that, I want you to stand right now because we're going to pray as a church. And we're going to pray for you and we're going to pray for each other. Stand up, Darren. Stand up, Simon. Come stand in the front. Everybody, let's stand close to each other. Right. Let's stand. Cool. Cool. 
Stacey, you just keep smiling, baby. Okay. And don't fall on your face. Right, Father, I thank you that today, as a church, as a body, we thank you, Father God, that you have given us a reminder that you know us by name and you were the one that got us started in the first place. And so, God, every person standing here under the sound of my voice has started a journey, has got started, and might find themselves in a place where they're in over their head, where they're in rough waters or they're between a rock and a hard place. And so, God, right now, I thank you that you would increase their faith, that they would know what to ask of you, Father God, that they would be reminded in that middle, that you are still with them, that you are a God that walks on waters and meets them, God, and you told, you, you've already given them the tools that they need to get to the other side. Father God, I thank you that you are a God that makes calm the storms around us. You are a God that changes circumstances before our eyes. You are a God that sets us and completes us. And so, Father God, I thank you that right now, I pray for Simon, God, that he would find peace in this place, God, that he would find a, um, just himself in a place where where it makes no sense, where the enemy would say you have to be stressed out, where you have to be overwhelmed, where you have to feel like you can't see the end from the beginning. But God, you would give him the space to stand up and have breathe, air to breathe. God, you would give him that breathing space and see you work a miracle in his middle. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you for your hand and Julia, God. And I thank you that where they've started this journey with you that you are just starting them. God, for what you still have for them is way bigger than they've ever seen before. God, I thank you for a miracle in their finances that they would give. I thank you for wisdom and God, even that thing of, of family and embracing God, they would enlarge their, their, their tent bags as they see the their influence in their family's life, God, and the faith that they have that you would take them to the other side. God, I thank you that they would never find themselves in over their heads or they would be reminded that you are with them, that it's not they're not going to go out under and God that they are not ever going to be at a dead end because you have already spoken your word. God I pray for Kelly and for Darren and I thank you for what you've started in their hearts God I thank you that there is purpose in their hearts God they are building and that you are going to take them God to places that they've never even dreamed or asked or imagined. I thank you Father God that middle would be such an encouraging place for them where they would see you walk on water before their very eyes and God I thank you that the things that you've already told them to do to get into those boats and pick up their oars. God, they would find it. They would find strength in it and they would find security in it as they see you doing things in their lives. God, I thank you for Joel and for Courts and as you've got them started, God, and the things that they have contributed and the way they've laid down their lives and the way that they serve, God, there is so much more for what you want to do, God. They have come through so many middles and I thank you, God, that this is just another chapter where they would see you doing something miraculous, God, in their faith. The things that they are trusting you for, God, I thank you for favor. I thank you, God, for wisdom and I thank you for influence in their lives. God, I thank you for open doors that no man can shut. I thank you, God, that as they sow out, God, they sow back into this church. And Father, there's an open gate over their lives. God, as there's just a freshness and as they as they um, they give, they serve, God, that you would refresh them. In Jesus' name we pray. I pray for Antoinette as well. God, I thank you that you got her started. You called her by name. You know her name and you she will never find herself overwhelmed that, you, that she would understand that she's not at a dead end and she would not find herself going under because God you are her personal God and I thank you that she would be reminded of that and you would pitch up in all her middles in Jesus name God I thank you for 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 Darren and for Katie and God even as they're in the middle going what next God the other side is waiting for them and the joy of what you've purposed for them and so God I thank you that right now this middle God would be glassy clear for them. That this middle, they would see Jesus clear. They would not be frightened, but they would know it's you and they would be reminded that you were the one that got them started. And so God, I thank you for just the security in their heart that you are their personal God. It's not a dead end and they're not going to go under. And Father, I thank you that as a church, we can stand together over every person that's not here today. God, that as we started this church and we put our faith out there and we said, God, use us to be an opportunity to the bulls out there. Be an opportunity to the people that just need to go, how are you? Be an opportunity to people that have found themselves in the middle, that just need a reminder that God has not left them. God, you've not spoken words that you're not going to fulfill. God, I thank you that our expectation is we will get to the other side. And so Father God, right now, every person in kids' church, in youth, in tots, and that isn't here today because of whatever reason, 
they would find refreshing, they would find reminding, and they would know that there's a, there's a host of heaven cheering us on, and there's an army of people that have got their backs. God, we pray for you. We ask you, Father God, to do everything that you've purposed for this church, in and through our lives, in our ordinary, everyday boats and oars that we are rowing. God, I thank you that right now we can trust you for this in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, for finances. We thank you, God, for, for business opportunities. We thank you, God, for protection over our children. They would not get sick. Father God, that they would not turn away from you, that they would grow up knowing that they are your children. You have called them by name and they are yours. We commit them to you, Father God, that no weapon formed against them would prosper, no strategy in, that the enemy has, has purpose for them would even prevail. But God, we thank you that these children are out of bounds. They would grow up knowing God. They would be a voice to their generation. They would be kind. They would be courageous. They'd be bold. They would be Samuels that know your voice and they would understand how to respond to it. There would be Daniels that in the face of opposition or people's opinions, they would still know that you are their God and there's way more for them in you than what the world has to offer. God, that they would be your Josephs, that you would take to places. God, that they would have influence, that they would understand that you have, you have purposed them and you have set them apart for greatness. God, I thank you they would never settle and they would be innocent of evil and excellent of good, that they would be repulsed by what the world has to offer and they would be drawn by the magnificence of who you are in your person. God, I thank you for every relationship we have, people that we are trusting you for, for salvation, the invitations that we've sent out, the people that we've invited. God, I thank you that those middle waiting periods are in your hands. And we ask you, Father God, that not one person that we have invited to church would be turned away and be lost, God. But I ask you that their lives would come into full contact and full face with you, God, that they would have the opportunity to know you. Father, I pray that where we need to be wise and, and, and give more opportunity to people to see God in us, make us creative, God. Give us the grace to do those things. Give us the wisdom, Lord God, to speak to people and give us the time and the patience and, and God, that we would be able to know when you stay back, that we stay with you, that we, not, we don't lose you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. And so, Father God, I commit this church, I commit every person here to you, and we thank you, God, for signs, wonders, and miracles. And that, Father, as we push into this, God, we will find ourselves on the other side of the middle, heading straight to the joy of completion. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.